journalism. And so how to protect one's uh, sources? This is uh, a uh, very topical subject. We've uh, often talked about uh, the uh, problem of the NSA, the National Security Agency in the USA. And uh, this is a fundamental area of our work uh, to protect our sources, protect our informers, uh, and more widely speaking, to protect uh, the freedom to inform and even democracy. It is both a legal question, uh, a lot of uh, debates have been generated uh, about uh, laws and the protection of journalism, and these are often heard about, uh, but uh, of course it is uh, not that one which we are going to touch on. It is also a question of technology. The new technologies are, of course, uh, and we are talking, have been talking about this since yesterday, a uh, significant opportunity for journalists to uh, make information flow better beyond uh, barriers, beyond uh, frontiers, and then to also to be able to uh, go around uh, monopolies of power. But this technology is also very vulnerable. We've talked about uh, the uh, surveillance of the NSA, but also in countries which are not at all democratic and which uh, are not at all turned towards the freedom to inform. It can become very dangerous. And mm, we have uh, talked about this in uh, the uh, in previous 4M uh, conferences. It is important for we journalists to develop a strong professionalism on these questions of protection and also protection of uh, technology of our sources. We are not always very good in this area. There are some journalists for whom uh, it is, of course, uh, vital. And in any case, it is something which uh, we need to, to approach in a very serious and professional manner. And it's not Olivier Lorelli who is going to contradict me on this. So I'm now going to uh, present you the uh, participants for this workshop. I'll start with you, Natalia Radzina. You are chief editor in uh, uh, Pol in Poland, you are Belarusian. You are based now in uh, Warsaw, and you are going to explain to us why you are no longer in your own home country to do your job, and uh, why you are still informing on the Biele Russia. You are one of uh, the journalists who works for the uh, Charter 97 uh, information website. It is one of the most uh, popular ones in the Biele Russia. And uh, yet you are not allowed to work on the ground in your home country. So you are going to give us the whole story, which has led you to Warsaw, and especially how now you manage to work uh, from a distance, and uh, how you protect yourselves, and how you protect all the people who work with you, and all those who have uh, remained in this European dictatorship. We also have Olivier Lorelli, whom uh, we've seen a lot in 4M. You are the specialist uh, for um, technological protection for 4M. You are not a journalist, but uh, you manage a company called Tolux, uh, which is uh, a company for uh, free uh, applications uh, which are uh, specialized in protection and protection especially from uh, IT intrusion. And you also host a blog. Is it a blog? Or? No, I have a personal blog, but uh, we have a small uh, media which is called roughly.info in France, which uh, links together journalists and bloggers and uh, citizen journalists. And um, so you will uh, tell us about uh, the professionalism of journalists confronted with these uh, technological issues. And you're also going to tell us about a few tools which would allow us to work in a much safer manner. So we'll start uh, with you, Natalia. It is an anniversary date for you tomorrow because one of the co-founders of the uh, site uh, Charter 97 was assassinated in 2010. He was called Alex Bebenin. And you are going to and tell us the story of this uh, website and why today you are condemned to be at a distance to be able to give information about Belarus. I will speak about the situation of Belarus. Uh, 
Every dictatorship starts from liquidation of uh, rule of law, independent parliament, independent legal system, uh, suppression of opposition and civil society and control over media. Belarus is not exception. In 1997, when I became a journalist, uh, Lukashenko absorbed power and started to deal with freedom of speech. First, I started to work on television, uh, but it was monopolized by authorities. Uh, it's okay? By, by authorities. Then I started to work for independent newspapers, but practically all of them were closed very soon. Then I started to work in the internet as a chief editor of Charter 97. Today is the most popular independent internet resource that, uh, that attract uh, 120,000 of unique visitors daily. Uh, we have uh, been working in Belarus for more than 10 years. It was hard. We had to work in illegal underground offices. We had been arrested during opposition rallies. Uh, but the hardest time came in uh, 2010. One of, one of, uh, on the eve of presidential elections, when Lukashenko uh, was providing the fourth president term to himself, several criminal cases were stated against our website uh, for publications criticizing authorities. Several searches were held in our office, offices. Special services were breaking into uh, out flats and confiscated all equipment. Founder of Charter 97, Oleg Bibinin, was murdered three months before presidential elections. He was found hanging. At the elections day on December 19, 2010, me and almost of my volunteers uh, were arrested. Reporters uh, were sentenced to a short-term administrative arrest. As a chief editor, I was accused of common crime, uh, commission crime organizing mass disorders. I was three uh, of up to 15 years in prison. I spent one and a half months in prison and several months under home arrest. I had to flee from Belarus on the eve of trial. Uh, at this time, my colleagues who managed to avoid arrest managed to continue functioning of Charter 97 in Lithuania. When I uh, reunited with them, we had to reorganize it our work. Our work. Uh, it was clear that uh, uh, there is no possible to work in Belarus anymore. Uh, we had to take editorial office out of sphere of influence of special services. We, have, uh, we had two main uh, triads, uh, Belarus, new areas and self-censorship. We could not work inside of Belarus without risk of being uh, imprisoned or murdered. We opened main office of uh, Charter 97 in Warsaw. Here we got support from Polish of authorities. In Belarus, we created network of uh, correspondents uh, and informants. All correspondents and uh, informants uh, work under, uh, under the cover. We publish information from them without their name. The information is sent from anonymous mailboxes via Skype and Facebook. Moreover, uh, most of correspondents uh, don't know each other on security reasons. Even journalists of editorial office in Warsaw don't know names of Belarusian correspondents. They keep communication directly with me. In case of necessary direct contacts with newsmakers inside of Belarus, materials are made from Warsaw by phone or Skype. We are also getting my, uh, much information from our readers and from ses, uh, sources in government. They are sending us uh, info from anonymous mailboxes, and we never discover our sources, even in cases when it would add uh, credibility to publication. At the same time, uh, we are always in contact with Belarusian and international organizations to provide necessary assistance to our journalists in case of repressions. Uh, of course, uh, there, are authors, there are authors who don't hide their names. Most of them are politi politicians and human rights activists who write to their blogs on our site. Key workers, uh, key workers of our site 
uh, working, who work in, in Warsaw are not recommended to visit Belarus. In case if they decide to visit their relatives, uh, they are instructed how to behave in case of arrest uh, uh, or KGB hooking. They are also not recommended to declare openly that they are work for Charter 97. The main principle of our work today is editorial office stays abroad and uh, works freely without self-censorship, without uh, fear of uh, being arrested or murdered. Correspondents who supply information have to work inside of Belarus underground. Merci. Thank you very much. Later, we will uh, hand over to the floor. Uh, you don't have a headset, so we will share a headset. Uh, Olivier, in what uh, you have heard, I think that the uh, question which I was raising earlier about the protection of sources is now vital. In fact, what uh, shocked me the most in what Natalia was saying is uh, the uh, political pressure um, separately from uh, the technological aspect. And uh, of course, uh, the technological aspect and uh, protection are correlated because uh, uh, in a country where we have uh, somewhat uh, hard powers, of course, uh, the powers that be will uh, uh, will vent their anger on journalists. This happens in all countries, even in democratic countries. Uh, I was talking about PRISM earlier, the uh, tool used by the uh, NSA, the National Security Agency in the USA. I think we will hear more about this later. And I think this, uh, in a country where the regime is uh, somewhat uh, harder and uh, so is, uh, has a regime of surveillance of the population. Of course, it's very tricky. It's what we've seen also in Syria and Libya. We know that uh, these are companies which, which are either American or French who have more or less collaborated to the implementation of this kind of surveillance tool. Even if they haven't directly collaborated, it's nevertheless their equipment which we find uh, over there. What we uh, often find in some countries where they don't have much by way of resources, these are fairly ingenious resources, ingenious tools, a combination of technical and uh, human tools. So we have uh, a uh, human network behind the technology. For example, in Tunisia, there was a, a technical infrastructure uh, to uh, listen to the population and intercept communications, but um, which uh, it was uh, based on a uh, human network, which uh, gave the alert to the authorities and to say that uh, we needed to uh, uh, watch this person somewhat uh, closer and uh, watch his uh, Facebook account. And then this is where we enter into a second phase. Uh, if uh, the technology allows you to identify a person, then, of course, uh, many people are going to uh, go to uh, see the activists or journalists who uh, are targeted and then they don't need uh, a lot of resources we just uh, use uh, a baseball bat so the person ends up uh, in a police station and uh, gets uh, but under pressure. In, uh, in France, of course, it is somewhat similar without, of course, the uh, baseball bat uh, or being kicked around. But uh, when uh, you are a journalist and that you are asked uh, for a password and that uh, you are not particularly protected, well, you hand over the password. Otherwise, you get uh, five years in prison and uh, 5,000 euros of uh, uh, fine. I was talking earlier about uh, telephone and Skype uh, conversations, and I read uh, your, uh, uh, I, I saw your, your hair stand up on an end. Uh, our tool has never been a secure tool. It was often uh, quite uh, tricky for the authorities to listen in, but uh, that is no longer the case. We know today that the NSA has a free access to it. They've managed to decrypt it and have access to all the communications. We also know that uh, the press agencies uh, regularly communicate with activists on the ground by Skype, but of course, uh, the communication is uh, is done from one from point A to point B. And if you know, if you don't know what the content was, you know that such and such a person contacted another person. So we haven't ne don't necessarily need to know the contact, the content of the conversation to be able to identify the person. When we know that I have a uh, French press organization has uh, contacted uh, such uh, a telephone number on such uh, ADSL line using a Skype protocol, of course, this is suspect. For some uh, paranoid countries, this is uh, automatically suspect. So. Uh, you mustn't imagine that uh, Skype is secure, even if uh, the uh, conversation encryption of the uh, 
conversations is not sufficient because uh, the protocol can be for Skype, it can be given to authorities. And uh, also, how do you know that the person who has downloaded Skype uh, in the country has downloaded the right version of Skype and that it is not uh, a uh, Skype which has been modified to allow interception and uh, watch? So uh, Skype is nothing other is is definitely not a, a, a means for security. We have first of all the uh, transfer of data, which will try to make as secure as possible by uh, encryption, and then we have the protection of the context, uh, which uh, we will try to use uh, by uh, anonymous measures. So to make things anonymous, let's try to avoid a third party to recognise the uh, uh, issuer and the receiver. So. You make uh, the source and the receiver anonymous. From there, you can uh, judge that the conversation is fairly secure, but that uh, they don't uh, work one without the other. You can't say that because the conversation is encrypted, then it is secure. No, um, there is a still a risk of being identified. And if uh, even if you haven't managed to identify the actual content of the communication, nothing stops the local authorities to go and uh, find that guy and uh, make him own up. Natalia, can you explain to us the methods which you have implemented both to collect information uh, from Belarusia, but also to be able to verify it? I imagine it is very difficult to verify the information which comes to you. Today, do you have efficient methods both uh, to uh, process information, uh, to do real journalistic work, uh, in detail, and also today, do you have access to sufficiently secure methods to allow you to totally protect the people who will inform you? As I said, uh, we have some, um, uh, uh, we're trying to help our people who give us the information. Uh, first of all, uh, we have not any uh, ways to. Uh, uh, give uh, to get information as it's only maybe uh, via email or uh, via Skype. I know the problem with Skype because in my criminal case, when I read the documents, I know that uh, it was some speeches from uh, uh, any opposition leaders in Belarus. It was some some speeches from the Skype because they are broken Skype account. But it, I, I think so. I don't know. Uh, it's maybe any cooperation with Skype or it will be a criminal broken of our accounts, as you understand. But the, yes, they can to read, the authorities, the KGB can to read our speeches in Skype. But we have any way. And maybe we use uh, using the Google Talk, we use an, an uh, anonymous uh, uh, email boxes, and so we try to get information. Some people go to Warsaw from Belarus, it's not so far. It gives information from hand to hand. Uh, we, try, uh, we never, uh, as I say, uh, said, we never uh, say who working with us. Journalists in Belarus never said that they are journalists from Charter 97, because it's maybe new criminal cases against, against these journalists. They working only underground, undercover, and um, uh, we. Uh, but I always uh, try and, um, to help him in any problem because we have good relations with international human rights uh, organization. And if you will have problem, we always say it about uh, this. Uh, our colleagues, we try and to uh, give it um, to invite is to Warsaw. Try, uh, they run to to to, to abroad. And uh, so, but, but it's very difficult. It's really, very really difficult because people now in Belarus and journalists also very afraid, afraid to, to be journalists, to be independent journalists, to be journalists of Charter 97. Later on, we will talk about the tools which uh, we can uh, use today, which are fairly straightforward. Uh, which allow us to protect ourselves both from uh, intrusion and uh, to protect uh, communication. And now I'd like to hand over to the room to respond to what we've heard or to um, bear witness. Uh, une question pour... A question for Natalia. Have you sometimes uh, not uh, given out information in order to protect uh, the source? So where is the limit between the requirement to inform and the requirement to protect your sources? Have? Oui, vous m'avez pas entendu. 
so you haven't heard? Do you sometimes have to choose to not uh, give out information in order to protect your source? not will be the sole situation. We're trying to do uh, all uh, and to help our uh, journalists. Uh, what about the source? It's, uh, it's an interesting situation now in Belarus because we have very many, uh, many information from the sources from government on uh, 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 different levels. And uh, all this information is anonymous, always. We're trying to, uh, um, to know it's true or not true. Uh, but all information now uh, is uh, outdoor, uh, is anonymous. But as, uh, when we are publish this, uh, in uh, maybe 19 percent, it's uh, true. The people in authorities always, always uh, trying to do anything. They are very afraid, of course, but they are trying, and uh, we have a, a lot of information. And um, I think. Uh, uh, it's, first of all, I must to say that the role of journalism in uh, democracy and in uh, dictatorships, uh, dictator, in, in dictatorships are very different. We know, uh, I know all rules of, uh, jo uh, of journalism, of Western journalism, but uh, sometimes we can't work on these rules. You must understand, sometimes we can't to say about our sources. Sometimes it's maybe not, um, it, it's not so easy now. When we will, be, uh, we will live in free Belarus, we will uh, try to work for the rules who are speaking uh, about, what, about speaking the Western journalist. But now it's, uh, it's a, as like a war, you must understand. Are there any other responses or questions in the room? <coughs> if, unfortunately, you have to reveal your sources under constraint in a particular situation, even if you would prefer to avoid it, what can you do? Are there tricks, last resorts, if you like, uh, the least uh, bad solution? Olivia has, uh, Olivia has uh, experience in this matter. I think there is no miracle solution. The first piece of advice that I would give is to simply not know who is your source. There is uh, an emblematic case uh, which is going through the courts in the USA at the moment called the Manning case, which where, where the website had done uh, everything possible to not to know the uh, name of the person who was at the origin of the diplomatic leaks. But even today, it uh, would be impossible to be absolutely sure that Andrew Lanning was actually the person who was uh, the uh, person who uh, sent these uh, informations to WikiLeaks. But this is a fairly specific case because within the mass of information, it wasn't very difficult to uh, to verify the, the truth of the information which was given, but it can be difficult for in other cases with other types of information. But uh, if uh, you are worried about uh, the risk uh, of uh, unveiling the source, if ever you are placed under constraint, the best way is to simply uh, have a, to not know who is the source and not have any way of identifying them. And then the uh, the second point is that when you are in touch with the sources which are fairly sensitive, there are some ground rules. You should not uh, stock the information uh, unencrypted on your computer. You should not uh, keep the information on a USB key which is going to be uh, handed around. You can use a virtualization technique so you can create in, uh, an environment in your operating system. Uh, a, a virtual area. There are also uh, applications that allow you to create, to, to partition your uh, hard disk and encrypt this uh, part of it. This is what I recommend to journalists who go on the ground uh, in hostile environments and who need to store information, whether videos or photos, to encrypt information. 
uh, you have to understand that this is not sufficient on its own because uh, nevertheless this encrypted part is visible, so you need to be able to hide it. But in addition, the actual encryption is not sufficient because if you look at what uh, the NSA is doing with prison today, these are people who are crazy, who store all information of all Americans, in, even encrypted conversation and with the uh, um, power uh, of uh, analysis that we have today, it was perhaps not possible to break the code uh, in uh, a uh, useful time scale, but who knows if this might not be possible in 10 or 15 years' time. So it's not because uh, an information is uh, secure now that it will be secure later. Natalia, would you like to respond to the question of this young journalist? Uh, with my colleague. It's a bit Justement, je, du coup, je rebondis là-dessus parce que c'était sur. Well, therefore, I'm going to uh, respond to this because we're talking about the internet, and this is a very topical. Is paper a good means to to obtain reliable sources? Because in that case, you just have a pen and paper. And at the moment, we're talking about uh, hyper-connectivity. And I've tweeted this just a minute ago. It's a real question, which I'm asking myself, do we need to continue to disconnect ourselves from internet, whilst, of course, remaining, in truth, connected to the internet? But in order to uh, be uh, within society, it looks as though we are a court between two things, and we're doing everything to abandon pen and paper. But I say no to this. I'd like to say that uh, everything which uh, doesn't transit uh, through a Google center, uh, Google bank, is a good solution. So pen and paper will remain a solution to uh, maintain the security of your sources. There's no doubt about that. The gentleman over there, just uh, wait for the microphone. Vous pouvez vous présenter peut-être, à moins que ça dévoile nos sources. Please introduce yourself. I come from Tunisia, editor for Nawet. So we work on uh, investigation, and we have to work with uh, sources, anonymous sources. But the context is very challenging in Tunisia because there are several uh, parties that organize uh, leaks, uh, sometimes not for the good uh, reasons, not for the good of the community in any case. So. How can a journalist actually protect himself from manipulation just uh, for very valid uh, information, but uh, with uh, political uh, implications? Je, je crois que je ne connais pas une source qui vous donne une information sans une arrière-pensée derrière. Euh... Well, there is always uh, a hidden uh, intention, uh, whether it be uh, commercial, whether it be political. Uh, you need to be aware of that. If you're aware of that, then you're okay. Because you need to know that the guy giving you information has always an interest in giving that information. So that's one thing you need to realize. Now, just be because people have an advantage giving an information doesn't mean that it's wrong. Uh, but um, also, uh, uh, the person will be anonymous, uh, but you can always try and uh, look uh, and investigate and try to see who that person is. I mean, there are new investigation techniques. His social network is a source of information, for instance, and it can uh, uh, you can launch one inf or send out one information and you get another information back. Uh, Sometimes it takes time, and sometimes we want to publish information very quickly. But the big challenge for us is time. Time. There are timing constraints. So it's all up to you, really. You need to decide. Yes, but that's in contradiction with what we said before, because the best way to protect your source is not to know your source. But that's quite contradictory with our job as journalists, because we have to be very detailed and know our sources to be to know whether what we're being told is true or not. Yes, I just a few years ago, I would have said yes. Before the internet, basically, I would have said yes, I agree. But now uh, there is the whistleblower, the whistleblower uh, uh, syndrome people who uh, uh, talk about uh, societal problem, environmental problems, etc. Those people don't need to be identified, but then you realize that the information provides added value and that it's true information. You don't need to know who it is. You can check. And um, there is 
some of this journalist work that is not disappearing. I'm not saying we're abandoning our job, but it's just that it has changed because of the development of the networks. Anybody else? I will be talking about something quite different. We talk a lot about Big Brother looking at us. Now, can we not use the same tools as the intelligence people to actually gather information? I'm not, uh, it might not be ethical, but I mean, can, do, do we have access to the same tools or almost the same tools as the one looking at us? In other words, you would uh, uh, listen to what uh, people, uh, some fr English newspapers did that and listen to people, but uh, it, uh, they had problems, you know. Well, from a legal point of view, first, in France are two kinds of interceptions. There's the national platform for judiciary interceptions, and that's a legal thing. It's under the control of a judge, and the judge says, yes, we have to listen to that guy. Then you have a second level, which is an administrative um, approach. Uh, it's like the prime minister cabinet and uh, uh, his team, uh, they want to listen to somebody. That's a bit more complex. It might be less legal. And for two years, we've been saying that there is a third level outside of the French borders and totally illegal, no legal framework. It's something that uh, national media are actually talking about. Le Monde has talked about it, actually. So using the same tools, no, it's not possible because you're not going to have access to the uh, submarine cables where there is information uh, transiting, so you're not going to have the same uh, uh, approach, a massive approach. And then the targeted approach, I mean, uh, some uh, French, uh, ger um, English journalists uh, did it and they had problems, big problems. And so uh, uh, the techniques uh, might be a bit uh, dodgy, uh, but it can work. What we do is that we try to see how the internet works in a given uh, country, who listens to us, how how it works, uh, is there a censorship based on the keywords, is there uh, a DNS uh, or address uh, blocks, uh, blocked, uh, etc. Can I send a link, uh, etc., etc. These are things we're asking questions uh, about. Finding a piece of equipment that is not too secure, yeah, entering a machine and see how the internet actually works seen from the inside in a given country. So uh, that's a technique that we can use. But you won't have, you can do that, but you won't be able to uh, listen to what people uh, do and uh, and so you won't, have, you won't be able to control that information. Natalia, when uh, Olivier tells us about this uh, uh, you realize that uh, you need to be increasingly technologically uh, uh, armed to protect your uh, sources. Now, you, within your team, uh, do you have uh, people like Olivier or Laurely who will uh, help you and uh, find you uh, technological solutions, uh, tools to continue doing your work? Uh, yes, we have some people, they're working from their abroad, not in Belarus. Uh, they're very good programmers, they help us. And uh, I, uh, uh, we have good relations with, with Canal France International. In this uh, year, we have very good uh, tra uh, training uh, from uh, this organization, and I hope we will have this in future. And uh, we are trying always uh, to help all technological uh, science and how uh, to help uh, our sources, how to help our journalists in Belarus, first of all. I should say that Reporters Without Borders uh, recently uh, set up a toolkit to uh, protect uh, sources. Yes, RSF worked with uh, Telecomics, which is a group of activists, uh, people who are very much uh, involved. to provide a tools, a toolkit for uh, journalists. It's a USB a stick with a secure information uh, with uh, tools to uh, ensure that your communications remain anonymous. 
And uh, this is something that uh, journalists uh, should always have with them when working on site, uh, uh, when traveling, because it, but sometimes it's not enough because you have to protect yourselves, you have to protect your sources, and it's not just based on the usage of tools. There is a methodology you need to have, and uh, uh, you might uh, have uh, ciphered uh, data, coded uh, data, but if you don't, can't have an anonymous context, and if you don't know the basic security rules, I mean, all of that will be pointless. So RSF will be uh, organizing uh, tools, uh, workshops rather, for these uh, to, to for, for people to become familiar with those tools. Can you just tell us a little more about the uh, the tools, uh, the fundamental tools uh, uh, that you need to have? The 101 is your machine, of course. Your piece of equipment, your hardware is not secure. Uh, if you take at the, if you look at the mobile phones, uh, whatever level of security you have, if you have an iPhone, uh, forget it. If you have Android-based uh, uh, phone, uh, forget about it. So you need to be aware of that. On a computer, you have a little more freedom. Uh, when you carry uh, data, of course, that data has to be coded and hidden. And uh, uh, for that, uh, there's TrueCrypt, uh, of course. It's the best uh, tool, easy to use, TrueCrypt. Then, uh, when you're working on site, there's the uh, anonymization of uh, data, transport of uh, data, and you need a VPN. So it's a coded tunnel, in a way. But all VPNs are not the same. You need uh, um, to focus on a VPN that uh, will uh, make your traffic anonymous. Then there are tools for email. There's PGP, the uh, coding uh, standard for uh, emails that you need to use on a daily basis, not just uh, from time to time, but I mean always. Even for the newsroom meeting, I mean, you should send emails uh, uh, in PGP. Um, recently, Al Jazeera was compromised by data phishing by the, uh, uh, the Syrian electronic uh, army. And uh, people from this uh, electronic army would circulate the identity of different uh, sources of Al Jazeera between themselves. And um, so you need to be aware of that. There are tools out there. Remember to use a free uh, operating uh, system. Uh, forget uh, MSN. Uh, uh, and all the rest of it, try Jabber, uh, maybe, which is a protocol that is fully decentralized. You can have your own Jabber server. Um, so anything you don't give to a large company like Facebook, uh, etc., is always a plus in terms of uh, security. I read rather worrying things when I see a Facebook account anonymous. It doesn't exist. You can't have an anonymous Facebook account. It's always traceable. Now there is the homing pigeon. You can always use a use a homing pigeon. Yes, in an RFC. Uh, uh, yeah, why not? There is the 1149 protocol, which is a data transportation uh, by birds, using birds. Last question. Beyond the tools, how can we know whether our computer is clean? Should I go to a, uh, where, where, who should I ask? And then PGP, what about privacy box? What do you think about it? Do you think it's good? Uh, and if so, uh, I, do you know, uh, do you have anything to tell me about the latest developments? Because one of the directors told another director that they would work with the uh, German uh, intelligence services. I can't tell you whether that's true or not, but using a third-party service, by definition, is based on confidence, trust. Of course, it's always better to have your own services, your own mail server, etc. Everything you control, you don't give away, basically. Uh, and then on your computer, is it secure or not? Well, in any case, your computer is not secure, full stop. Say about the situation with us. As, uh, two, uh, one year ago, the chart 97 was broken, and all information for next, uh, some months was disappeared. 
And um, after that, we're trying to, uh, to make investigation what, what happened. And we know, uh, after that, we know that uh, special sources of Belarus pay the big money and uh, make a special program and uh, uh, put it to computers between uh, flashcards or between uh, links uh, to uh, which sent for your mail. And after that, the computer was um, uh, with a virus. It's this virus not find by uh, antivirus programs. And, uh, but after that, special sources can to, fo to follow on uh, all your job on your computer. And uh, when we uh, make the investigation with very good specialists from, uh, from the Western countries, we know that all computers of the polit opposition the politics, of all uh, human rights, and uh, most uh, pot, um, uh, famous independent journalist was with this virus. After that, we uh, make a, a program and uh, help these people uh, to, to, to make this compu their computers clean. But it was very interesting because uh, the people know, uh, can know that there are virus uh, in his computers because antivirus is not found. Right, thank you very much. I think we've come to the end of this uh, workshop. What we developed uh, in these uh, 45 minutes is the fact that it's a constant race that you constantly need to update your uh, disk. Uh, the tools you're talking about today might be obsolete in six months, even before. But in any case, we need to develop a true professionalism, appro professional approaches for uh, journalists, uh, for vital uh, questions in Belarus, of course, for uh, more uh, less uh, vital uh, questions, but still very uh, democratic questions in, in other countries. It's just one thing I would like to say, is that in France we're quite lucky because we have competence uh, services like ANSI, and they're very much willing to provide uh, training, uh, advice, uh, tools even to work uh, on site. Now, uh, I've come across uh, reporters on site who uh, sorry, but uh, who uh, just uh, went on site with their computer not knowing anything, just using their iPhone uh, to uh, interrogate or interview rebels, etc. Those guys are crazy. They jeopardize themselves and they jeopardize their sources. Very dangerous. Thank you. Thank you very much.